Hey y'all, Scott here. Wow, it's almost like you don't need things to be happy. You don't need them to be fucking pissed either. So, I gave away my entire video game collection as a part of community service to get out of prison this month. Which means not only do I no longer own Sonic Jam, I'm also no longer the guy who owns Sonic Jam! Now I gotta rebuild my game collection and that's gonna be pricey. But that's okay, because I know a few tricks on how to get all the games I need for practically nothing. Video games are expensive. Well, stop playing them like that! You spend a full $70, then $35 to get the contents of the Digital Deluxe Edition, which is only $100, but I want to get punished for not having the foresight to buy that version first. Of course, I need a PlayStation Plus subscription to B, so at this point, I need a persistent and stable internet connection and a roof. So now I need a loan for a house, but, but I can't, can't with this credit score. score. So how are we going to raise it? Well, 5,000 Luther coins is a start. In the end, how much does it cost to play Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League? My will to live. Modern game prices are out of control. They expect me to blow all my cash on every new release, plus their downloadable content while making recurring payments to each subscription service every month and investing in accessories that are more expensive than the game console themselves the right to, but still. But I'm here to tell you, it doesn't have to be this way. You can have just as much fun for free as you can with a modern game for $70. Gaming on a budget. Some may call this impossible. Playing video games is one of the most expensive hobbies you can have. To that I say, introducing heroin. Yes, many video games are overpriced, but I personally believe in the grand scheme of things, if you play your cards right, this is a fairly large bang for your buck kind of medium. I mean, what? $30 for a digital 83 minute movie and 20 to rent it? Bunch of cool bitches come up with these prices. But even then, there are so many cheap and or free options to watch movies. Tubi, Larceny. And the same applies to video games. If you set your mind to it, you can get by on damn near nothing, all while playing some of the greatest, longest lasting experiences of all time. Yeah, okay, but I still bought Suicide Squad. Now I've already discussed gaming on a budget years ago, and by now I've already discussed gaming on a budget years ago, I mean, I f***ed up. Only four minutes spent on this topic and one of those precious minutes being used to just gawk in a game store and what was my conclusion? To buy Trivial Pursuit for Xbox? Uh, yes, that was great advice on my part. Oh, you just got shot in the face? Well, don't do that! I mainly wanted to showcase how you can get a lot of entertainment out of something that costs very little. But there's so much more to discuss here. Like how do I get out of debt? They say the best things in life aren't free. Oh yeah, well what do they say about this? They say the best things in life aren't free. But that doesn't mean there aren't quality free gaming experiences out there. Uh, for one, we can milk the hell out of some demos. Uh, who needs to buy Sonic Forces when we can just play the demo for free? Oh, it's almost as bad as the full thing. I'm looking to find the most bang for my buck demo. And with my buck being, so my bang being, there is no bang. It's obvious I can't expect much, but I wanted to find demos that could either be played indefinitely or could practically be their own standalone games with how in depth and long they are. But listen, if you need me to tell you what the best free things are before you buy them for free, you might as well ask me, should I eat this? Damn. It's so obvious what to do here. Just try it yourself. That's the point of a free demo. And hey, if you're that desperate for entertainment, why aren't you actually? God, I just need something to play for free. I said something, not some things. Scott's definitive list of free demos you can get just as much, if not more, out of than full games. First up, Poyo Poyo Tetris 2. I mean, really. Any puzzle game like this can be played indefinitely, even if the options here are extremely limited. Uh, you're still playing Tetris and Poyo Poyo. Every time you play, it'll be a fresh experience, which means theoretically, you could just jam on this and you'd be set for life. Life sucks. Clubhouse Games Guest Pass. This may be primarily a free app for local wireless multiplayers. So you only need one full copy of the game to play across multiple switches, but it comes with four full games on its own. And when it comes to this tabletop stuff, I mean, 
It's timeless. You aren't human if you get sick of this. Yep, you aren't human if you get sick of this. This is my way of weeding out the frogs in the audience. The demo for Life is Strange 2 is a standalone experience titled The Awesome Adventures of Captain Spirit, which on its own is about an hour and a half long, and for a story-based game like this, I mean, there you go movie. But in addition, with the first two Life is Strange games being episodic, the first episodes of each are free. Well, that's the case for tons of these types of releases, so if you have no problem with cliffhangers... That was truly sad. Thanks for your concern, Max Coff. You're set! Capcom Arcade Stadium 1 and 2 follow this setup, all right? You download them for free, and then you buy the classic arcade games you want, or just pick up the bundle featuring all of them. But in that initial free download, you get a full, original, old-school Capcom Arcade humdinger. That's right, in Arcade Stadium 1, we get 1943 Battle of Midway, and in 2, we get Sansan. I know, if this is free, what's the point of currency to begin with? But hey, two retro arcade titles readily offered free of charge. You can't beat that. Unless you're not Sansan. Final Fantasy XIV Online is completely free until you hit level 70. No limit on where you can go in the game, how long you can play, just until you level up enough, you don't have to pay. Thank God I suck. But hey, RPG demos in general can be some of the most in-depth out there, with many bringing your progress over to the full game once you buy it. Though I'd say on their own, they're not really all too milkable. I mean, are you really gonna infinitely replay the Octopath Traveler 2 demo? Are you really gonna play Sansan? This list here was mostly just for fun, considering how many actual games you can get for free these days. Uh, especially if you don't mind free to play games. Some hate them. Others hate them more, but you can't deny how successful this model can be for certain titles. Uh, lowering the entry fee to just your integrity. Problem with these is most are not completely free. I mean, sometimes it's impossible to progress at all without forking over some cash. Uh, grab some upgrades via microtransactions and what have you. And then if you're playing a free-to-play game on mobile, what, every four times you tap the screen, a new minute-long unskippable ad pops up and it's like, oh, great. After seeing this for the 80th time, Fine, all right, I'll do something different and pick Swim Away quietly. There's definitely more than enough of this type of free content out there, and a lot of it can still be great fun, but it's so easy to find free-to-play games these days. Let's talk some purely free games. No asterisk, no microtransactions, no ads for better games, and we can find an unlimited supply over on the PC. By that, I mean CoolMathGames.com, but let's go a bit more traditional here. Street Fighter Cross Mega Man is an official PC game that's always been available for free. It started life as a fan game, but once Capcom caught wind of it and realized they needed something to celebrate Mega Man's anniversary, they made a deal with the developer and fully backed the project, which is simultaneously really cool and really fucking lame. This didn't feel like Capcom published this for the greater good. It felt like they did it out of desperation. This was during a time in which Mega Man was in the slums. Multiple game cancellations and no new real title for years, but hey, look at the bright side. I've been angrier. So Street Fighter Cross Mega Man being a fan game retooled into something, anything Mega Man related for Capcom to pump out, it's a bit pathetic. But it's also a pretty good classic Mega Man experience, retailing for a whopping free. And it's only on PC, but it costs nothing to download, much like the Elder Scrolls Arena and Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. That's right, the first two Elder Scrolls games are completely free on PC. These incredible, groundbreaking RPGs you can spend hundreds of hours in are just being given away. It makes no sense. Let's play them. Damn, they're just giving this away for free? Yeah, these you truly have to be devoted to to get much out of. But if they are your thing, congratulations! Your debt matters not! But hey, if we want something a bit less archaic, the original version of Cave Story on PC has always been free. Even after it received a Wii release in 2010 for 12 bucks, a Nintendo Switch release in 2017 for 30, the core game from 2004 is free. And you wouldn't know that looking at me. It's one of the most revered indie games of all time, and it's just 
there. I know some fans vastly prefer the original to any of these paid re-releases, so you really can't go wrong here. Uh, same goes for the original version of Spelunky, another indie darling. Uh, problem is, comparing this to the modern release, Damn. But see, that's the funny thing about Cave Story. It's the opposite. I'm paying more for less. Indie games are some of the most frequent freebies you can get. Oh, Minecraft back in its early days was a free download. But that's just the thing. It wasn't free forever. So sometimes you gotta act fast. God damn it, I tried. The Epic Game Store on PC. Some hate it, others Hate it. But because of that, Epic Games has attempted week after week to offer premium titles for free at no cost to the user, other than using the Epic Game Store. Oh man, you have Guardians of the Galaxy? How much did it cost? Nothing, but, but like, f man. So those are just a handful of ways you can play games for free. Oh, oh that and stealing. Yeah, all right. I've been primarily talking about games that were officially released for free. Unless we want to open up a can of ew. I mean, who are we fooling here? You ask for games to play for free and I tell you don't sh your pants. Just Google play Mario. Is it really your fault if you're playing an unauthorized free emulation of Mario 2 if it's this easy to do and Nintendo hasn't taken it down yet? I don't even have to download anything. This is all in a browser. Yeah, so the concept of a what free games are out there kind of falls apart when to find half of these in the first place, I have to Google play Sonic games for free. And what, I'm just supposed to ignore the thousands of results with the actual games and pretend that the free visual novel they released for April Fool's Day is a legitimate recommendation on how to play a Sonic game for free? With just a laptop, you can access so much free content. And on dedicated video game consoles, most free titles are free to play or they're free for a limited time. And honestly, if you wanna know which ones are worth your time, why are you wasting your time listening to me? Just download whatever looks cool to you. So. Let's focus on something else, saving money by spending money. Oh yeah, time to budget. I think I speak for everybody when I say subscription services are far from exciting these days. Hell, I'd go as far to say I'd rather be happy than have a Peacock account. I have a Peacock account. But I think these services get out of hand when you're juggling multiple. If you hone in on one in particular that's delivering the entertainment you want, you can get a lot of value out of it. So let's take a look at these, starting with Xbox Game Pass. And I already know this is a great deal because we can just keep buying Pop-Tarts and get a free week of this thing. You know what that means? We're crossing gluttony off the list. Xbox Game Pass has a few different options here. The cheapest being the core membership. For 10 bones a month, you get online multiplayer and a bit over 30 games you can download and play, which does change from time to time. This isn't a permanent list by any means, but it's obvious Microsoft intends it to always hit the quality standard of pretty good. A great variety here with indie games, simulation games, first person shooters, online multiplayer titles, local multiplayer titles, RPGs, platformers, classic games, modern hits, the works. For only $10 a month, this is great. As a scam, $100 a year for access to a handful of titles. Access to, they aren't playable forever and the lineup gets shaken up a few times a year. And with many of these games being priced at, oh man, three numbers? It really doesn't feel worth it. That is until you add up the value of all the games included and it turns out this is actually hundreds of dollars in value. So yeah, it really does feel worth it until you realize it really doesn't feel worth it. So I went on price charting websites and found the cheapest going rates of any games available via physical methods. And if they're digital only, the MSRP on the Xbox store and yeah, yeah, even with many of these titles going for incredibly low prices, the sum of owning all of this is well over $400. But that's the thing, owning all of this is well over $400. Keep in mind, you don't own anything with these services, and by owning the physical stuff, you can resell that. And the concept of all this being valued at over $400 makes me question, you really gonna play all this? Yeah, it's $100 a year for 30 plus games worth well over that, but are they really worth anything if you're not even gonna boot them up? I find that many of these subscription services are more about convenience than value. 
Like, just the concept that I could play any of these games at a moment's notice is enough for me. And yes, Game Pass Core is how you get online multiplayer. So, these games are more so a bonus rather than the reason you buy into the service. But I'm just looking at this from the perspective of somebody who wants to get games on the cheap. But with Game Pass Core having such a small selection of titles, I'd recommend either just picking up the ones that interest you rather than paying an ongoing fee or flat out biting the bullet on Game Pass Ultimate. Now this is more like it! Access to hundreds of games, some of which are brand new $70 releases, day and date on Game Pass. Well that seems like a- I paid $200 a year to play $70 games before they cost $15 that very year. Here's some financial advice! Alright, so Game Pass does have a ton of value, but a lot of it depends on how varied your tastes are. Like maybe one day you're feeling Madden 22, and then the next Madden 23. Though I know what I'm doing tomorrow. It all comes back to my original point of, if you're not gonna play a good chunk of these, why even bother? Make a checklist of all games available via Game Pass to see how many you're actually going to play, and if it's a decent amount, sure. Hell, if you can play through the games you want to play through in two weeks, it'll only cost you a dollar. And if this is your only method of playing games, you don't want to buy anything else, just Game Pass, $200 a year isn't horrible for what can amount to hundreds of hours of entertainment. But keep in mind, many of these titles frankly worthless. Used game stores are practically giving them away, so why play them under a monthly subscription fee if that's 17 times more expensive than just a one and done purchase? Well, because you get all these other games and it's so convenient. Here, as a Game Pass subscriber, I'm gonna play Gotham Knights. This game stinks. Game Pass is cool, but I wouldn't rely on it year round for all things gaming, considering how as I browse the lineup, 80% of it looks exactly the same as five years ago. And as frequently as new games get announced to be joining Game Pass, they leave just as fast. But that's not to say this isn't a good service to take advantage of. I'd say if a new game releases into it that you know you'll play within that month, uh, just subscribing for those 30 days is an effective way to play select modern titles on the cheap. Uh, just remember to cancel when you're done. Hey Scott, Future Scott here. You forgot to cancel Game Pass. Oh my god, is everything okay? Better than okay. It's not bad. Thanks to Game Pass, I'm flat broke, which means I can't buy into Ubisoft Plus. I think it goes without saying, but any publisher-specific subscription service, yeah, that's not the smartest move when you're so broke you have to eat the inedible. $18 a month for Ubisoft Plus? That's more expensive than Game Pass. Who cares about Ubisoft exclusively enough to subscribe to this? Same goes for EA Play, which is already included in an Xbox Game Pass Ultimate membership. And like, what are you getting this by itself for? FIFA 17? Now on the PlayStation side of things, there's PlayStation Plus, which is practically the same as Game Pass. I mean, you don't get as many day one AAA releases as that, but is that really a benefit of Game Pass? <laughs> Hey, think about it this way, if you have Game Pass, you could play these games without having to buy them outright. Why would I want to play them to begin with? PlayStation Plus's game catalog has the benefit of PlayStation exclusives being a part of it, and a lot of the same kind of stuff you see in Game Pass, all at a comparable price point, so it depends on which lineup or console you prefer. Uh, but my advice remains. Don't take my advice. Subscription services can be used to your benefit if you're on a budget, even in other ways outside of just canceling after a month. You can find all kinds of deals out there from different stores where these memberships are cheaper. My problem comes into play when we consider where all this money is going. Turns out, it's going to gone. This is what I'm talking about when I say these services are about convenience, not value. I spend $10 a month and I get permission to play Gotham Knights. Well, gee. Thank God I didn't waste money on this, I say as I'm spending $200 a year. Or how about I just spend $5 more on a one and done purchase and then I can do whatever the hell I want with this thing. Hell, maybe even sell it for more than I bought it for. You never know, it could happen. My point is, if you're looking to play on the cheap, Take advantage of these services when it makes sense to. They offer a ton, but don't depend on them because if you're not careful, you forget you're subscribed or there's nothing that's interesting to you on them, it is genuinely the equivalent to flushing your money down the toilet. Hey, I may have bought Gotham Knights, but at least I can flush the money down myself. So yeah, under most circumstances, I'd say physical video games are better to nab if you're looking to game on a budget. Speaking of which, 
am very fortunate to be based out of Toledo, Ohio. And for my next lie, I have 12 fingers. We have supposedly one of the best zoos in the country. Yeah, I don't know about that one. King of the jungle, my ass. Tony Pacos is a big name around these parts. So is Wendy's. And it's nicknamed the Glass City. Wise. <laughs> Huh, that. But regardless of what you may think of Toledo, the fact is we are swimming in used video game stores. Uh, something not many can say about their hometown, so I understand how fortunate I am to be living in Toledo. But I know that isn't the case for everybody, so I'm not telling you, hey, I can pick up clacks after lunch. What's your excuse? Rather, I want to show that buying secondhand games is one of the most effective ways to play on the cheap. And what better way to do that than supporting local business? Like GameStop. You might as well kick things off with the one everybody knows, because if you want used games now, uh, GameStop is probably the best bet for any average person in the US. Oh my god, Scott, stop being so negative. GameStop was never incredible, but back in the day, there was at least stuff to look at in here. Now, it's just the blandest, most barren walls of video games I've ever seen. And focusing on just modern titles and geek merchandise on clearance means there's little to discover or explore in a GameStop. But we can damn well try. Basically, I want to spend a clean 100 bones on a game console and a stack of games that I can imagine lasting me quite a long time. Starting with the game console, the cheapest one available is the original Xbox One, damn it. All right, well, there's no point in doing this if I can go on eBay right now and get this same console with games and Included, as destiny as they may be for the price point I limited myself to. I don't want to act like you can't get good games for good prices at GameStop, but it can be pretty situational. And in the case of consoles, we can get these cheaper elsewhere. So let's just focus on spending $100 on games from GameStop for our Xbox One we just bought on eBay for another $100. <laughs> For $100 at GameStop, I was able to pick up Rare Replay, The Witcher 3, Madden 20, Immortals Phoenix Rising, Gears of War 4, Grand Theft Auto 5, Hasbro Family Fun Pack, Rise Son of Rome, Battlefield 5, Titanfall 2, Just Cause 3, Tales of Arise, Red Dead Redemption 2, Rage 2, Middle Earth, Shadow of War, Prey. Okay, scratch Red Dead. Better. This is a pretty great lineup for the price. But I gotta be honest, I was struggling with the stock they had. GameStop ain't what it used to be, but thankfully, they had enough used Xbox games available to net a good library for $100. Now, for the next person who walks in trying to net a good library for $100, I am so sorry. The star of the show here is Rare Replay for five bones. That's 30 titles across 30 plus years of gaming history, spanning all different kinds of genres. Uh, sure, not all of them are winners. In fact, I'd say about half of the games included are downright unfortunate. But Rare Replay also includes some of the most beloved games of all time as well. A couple with tons of side content and unlockables. For $5, I genuinely don't think we could have gotten a better value here. Could have been cheaper, though. All right, so Madden here can just represent any sports game if that's your thing. I mean, like, if you're on a budget and you like playing sports games, just buy the previous years. Hell, all fans of these sports games say how much better the previous years were, so... Why are we doing this? I think it counts in the red. Oh, hey, Madden. The Witcher 3, Grand Theft Auto 5, Immortals Phoenix Rising, Just Cause 3, all meaty open world games you can play forever. I mean, GTA and Witcher alone would suffice, but these two are a quality time for undeniably low prices. Uh, games like Rise, Son of Rome, Titanfall 2, Rage 2, Prey, Battlefield 5, Middle Earth. I mean, I primarily picked up because they were dirt cheap and solid titles. Tales of Arise gives us a meaty RPG. Gears of War 4 is fine. And Hasbro Family Fun Pack, because when in doubt, play Scrabble, bitch. I feel that for $200, this collection and an Xbox One, it's all you really need. You can live off of this for years, and honestly, if you're desperate for something new, here. Thankfully, with these systems having online stores and multiplayer, even after you exhaust the possibilities of your physical game collection, you can just milk the piss out of all the free junk you can download. There's always Tubi. Always. Now, even though I feel these games would suffice for quite a while, keep in mind, we own these now and can do with them as we please. And at the very least, trading them back into GameStop nets us roughly $15. And you know what we can do with that? Well, it's probably better to sell this stuff independently on eBay or maybe even the independent game stores. From the Toledo, Ohio area, it's Flotsam Games and Collectibles. Where GameStop falls short, Flotsam picks up the slack. Uh, but unfortunately, 
Game prices ain't what they used to be, especially consoles. I remember back in 2017 when I picked up an original Xbox and a stack of games for only 60 bones, whereas now, the Xbox itself is 100. I mean, what can we get? A Sega Genesis for 60? And if you're struggling to put food on the table, I'm not gonna tell you to eat Sonic fucking spinball. I think it's goofy as hell to recommend anything like this for gaming on a budget. Like, one, you can emulate every and any Sega Genesis game on a damn not Sega Genesis, that's for sure. Yeah, you can say that about most consoles, but these ones? It's almost too damn simple to just play them on PC. Hell, like I said, just Google Play Sonic. It's like, am I really gonna tell you to invest in this? B, these games, while many are timeless classics, I mean, they aren't gonna last you long. Yes, I can play Mario 1 till the end of time, but it's more of a game you replay once a year for 30 minutes till the end of time. And hey, why limit yourself to a Sega Genesis when every console has a Sega Genesis collection for it? I think it's far better advice to go for consoles that aren't playable in web browsers and have games that are comparable to modern releases. And if that's not a Sega Genesis, it must be a PlayStation 3. An original console itself costs 100 bones, but the games? I was able to pick up Batman Arkham Asylum, Nino Kuni, Battlefield 3, Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5 Remix, Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim, Borderlands 2, Uncharted 2, Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, Mass Effect 2, Red Dead Redemption, and Just as Gods Among Us, Burnout Paradise, Assassin's Creed 2, and Minecraft, all for two hundred in total. Uh, pretty comparable to the Xbox One lot. I feel that many of these games scratch the same itches. Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection is a damn good compilation of classic Genesis games. I wouldn't say it's as good as Rare Replay, but that one covers a wide breadth of titles from all different eras and platforms, which is what makes it so cool at its core. But this one's way more consistent, just 40-something classic Sega games. Have at it. Red Dead Redemption is definitely our Grand Theft Auto V here, but Hey, that game is also on PS3, so you're not missing out on the opportunity to play this if you don't have a PS4 or PS5. Which, hey, that is something to consider. Many of the games we're playing these days began life on these older consoles. GTA V, Skyrim, Minecraft. You don't need the latest and greatest to play this garbage, though it is fair to mention now, Minecraft for PlayStation 3 has not received updates in years. Grand Theft Auto V's online was shut down, uh, Skyrim on PS3, Stinks. But the core single player games are still there. Uh, they may not run as well and look as good and have as many features as the versions on subsequent platforms, but you can definitely get by with them. In fact, nearly all of these received remasters or re-releases, which says a lot about their quality. These are timeless games. They're just a little crunchy here, but they're all more than playable here on PlayStation 3. And considering the variety, open world games, racing games, first person shooters, RPGs, fighting games, action adventure games, retro games, and literally every other genre possible in the Genesis collection, for $200, you get one beefy ass lineup in a great console that's sure to last you a while. But if we compare it to what I picked up on Xbox One, I mean, it's not like the games here are leagues better than the games there. In fact, most of the PS3 games I got are available or have equivalents on Xbox One, which is a far more modern system, so most of its online features are still available, and the games will all run better on it, and the store includes all kinds of free trinkets to mess around with. I gotta be honest, I think the Xbox One is a better deal here. So how about the Xbox 360? Because one of these consoles we can snag for a cool 75. Game-wise, Flotsam was offering this bundle of Assassin's Creed 2, Batman Arkham City, Battlefield 3, Borderlands 2, Call of Duty 4, Dishonored, Gears of War 3, Grand Theft Auto 5, Halo 4, Lego Marvel Super Heroes, Madden NFL 25, Sega Superstars Tennis, and Xbox Live Arcade Disc for $30. Okay, so this is more of a freak accident than an actual price point you can find these games at, but it just goes to show, if you look around enough, this kind of stuff is possible, and it's all thanks to lack of market relevance. Who wants Assassin's Creed 2 for Xbox 360? Not them. Nintendo and PlayStation have their diehard fans and collectors. Xbox? I mean, they're there, but it's just not the same. Maybe it's the lack of distinct, long-lasting franchises, save for Halo, it's shorter legacy by comparison, or sneakers. But second-hand Xbox stuff has always been valued quite a bit lower, and I don't see that drastically changing anytime soon. I was told the original Xbox is THE console to collect for. It's cheap as dirt now, but just you wait. I've become a man in that time. Sure, the original console's gone up in value, but the games? See, you'd think this is a sticker, but no. Just what the game is. 
fucking worthless. But just because the price is low doesn't mean the quality is too. I just don't think old Xbox games are in demand like the other platforms. I mean, what would you want here? Bad example, but hey, that just proves it's good to take advantage of the lack of demand. Here at Flotsam, I also picked up Cameo Elements of Power, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, plus Viva Pinata Combo Pack, Trivial Pursuit, Tetris Evolution, Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, Just Cause 2, Far Cry 3, Fallout New Vegas, Create, LA Noir, Dead Rising, and Skate 3, all for a grand total of $1.99. Jesus Christ. What a way to save money. After all of that, I saved negative $600. And yeah, I feel like we got a good idea as to what the used game market at retail is all about these days. Uh, yes, prices are higher across the board, but that doesn't mean you can't find good deals. Just might have to look around at different consoles than you're used to. I'd honestly recommend an Xbox One to those looking for a cheap console with affordable games. Uh, sure, the Xbox 360 is less expensive, but it's less expensive. A newer console means it's less likely to bust, and the online servers and storefront will be active for the foreseeable future, meaning you can download free junk, play online multiplayer, use Xbox Game Pass. And hey, the Xbox One is backwards compatible with a pretty large selection of 360 and original Xbox games, which are damn cheap. Hell, most of the games I bought for the 360 from Flotsam Games work here. If they don't, there's a remaster or equivalent available on the platform. I don't think the Xbox 360 console lot from Flotsam was a bad deal at all, but if you're gaming on a budget, I think it's important to not only factor in the price, but how far that platform can take you. But hey, I still grabbed all these games and loads more from the used game stores. The collection's starting to fill out again. But since the Xbox One is my console of choice for gaming on a budget, I feel I should get more games for that. But where? You all thinking what I'm thinking? Say it with me now. Who, Who gives, gives a shit? Let's, Let's go, go to a garage, garage sale. sale. Garage sales. Yeah, that's a great idea to get more Xbox One games on the cheap, especially when they all come with mulch for free. Garage sales, yard sales. Yeah, you can find good deals at them, but at that point, you can find good deals anywhere. Just go house to house and ask people, do you have video games? These are more often than not a waste of time. What, you gotta spend your Saturday driving around neighborhoods, squinting at signs, trying to decipher an address, then you go out of your way to show up just to be greeted by used baby clothes? And not even good ones. And you're taking a gamble as to if these sales will even have games, let alone working ones. It's almost always picking through the dirtiest, grimiest junk all to find a copy of Disney Infinity 2.0. Okay, well, at least, nope, it's Major League Baseball for the Intellivision. No, oh, no, that's blood. I think it's fair to say, don't completely write off any method of finding games at a good price because it can happen anywhere. But hey, time is money, and it's up to you to decide what's worth it and what's not. Do you really want to dumpster dive a GameStop to find free games? I mean, we've all seen videos of the insane stuff people have found. Hey everybody, I just risked it all and looked inside the GameStop dumpster, and their trash is in great condition. More often than not, I buy my games on eBay and Amazon these days. Not because I'm looking for the best deal, rather, it's just easier. Convenience wins for me. If I want a specific game then and there, I'm okay paying a bit extra for shipping, quality, and the immediacy of finding what I want compared to hunting for it via garage sales for months, maybe years on end. That's what you pay for online, though stellar deals can still be prevalent. Lots, just big fat stacks of an assortment of games. If you're looking for a specific title, try including the word lot in the search and see if anybody's bundling it with others for a lower price. Combine that with referencing price charting websites to do a little bit of math to figure out if A plus B equals C. Look at this, I'm getting f***ed. Take this lot for example, 16 Xbox One games, brand new, sealed. Starts the bidding at 100 bones or we can buy it now for 130 and with the value of all of this being Oh my god, $80 off? I'm losing money not spending it. Well, keep in mind, these are all new copies. If all of these were used, holy f I'm saving $4. Think of everything I can buy. But before we do that, God damn it, I already bought runts. If we're just looking to play these games, so who cares if we have cases and manuals and whatnot, the lowest average prices of all of this added up is... But 
hey, these are new copies, and they are worth more, so I can just resell the games I don't want. Yeah, go ahead, try and sell these games. Overwatch 1 doesn't even work anymore. So that's the dark side of video game lots. Yeah, this seems like a great deal, but think about it. Are you going to play all of these? And if you aren't, do you really want to go through the rigmarole of selling them? And if you did, do you even think you could? Many of the games included in these are filler titles that sellers are just trying to get rid of. Nobody buys them on their own, and if you're not careful, you will be stuck with these. I've had sexier nightmares. Lots can be a great way to score some deals, but you want to make sure you're actually getting a deal on the games you want here, and you can actually sell the games you don't want. In the used game market, price charting is my best friend. On a related note, I'm depressed. Use it to see what the going rate is on games to tell if a price is lower or higher than it normally goes elsewhere, and you should be good to go. But we can always go gooder. Some public libraries have used games available, of which you can use your library card to rent them out for free. Well, that's hard to beat. Also, damn hard to find. I think a lot of libraries tried to offer games and then immediately stopped once people took the games and ran. But hey, you can always visit your local one and see if they have some. I visited mine and found The Witcher, Tom Clancy, but I know if I want to get serious about game rentals, you gotta turn to Blockbuster, Redbox, Family Video. Game rentals exist about as much as my patience right now. I mean, what options are out there for me? Gamefly? our lord and savior. Okay, so I can rent two games at a time, max, for roughly the same price as Xbox Game Pass and PlayStation Plus, or I can download any of these games. I don't have a limit to how many I can be playing at a time. I don't have to wait for my game to ship or worry about sending it back or the game coming in like, oh, damn, no manual? Now, let's be fair here. This is a far wider selection of titles, including the latest and greatest compared to PlayStation Plus. I think Gamefly is good if you want to experience a few brand new releases, plus you can outright buy some games from them and they can have some pretty sweet deals. So they're good to keep in mind as an option. But when half the new releases these days are old ass games anyways, why even bother? Always a good idea to compare a full price re-release with the original to see if any enhancements or additions make it worth it. For example, if you were looking at a Nintendo Switch and the games you wanted were mostly all Wii U games, compare the going rates of both and consider what that old Wii U can do that a Switch can't. Maybe you don't care about any of the new original games or online multiplayer, DLC, or whatever. You just want to play Donkey Kong find that son of a bitch someday. It's hard to recommend specific things to do and buy because it always depends on the individual in question's situation and preferences. Uh, like buying a Wii U is more cost effective than the Nintendo Switch, but does that make up for everything? To some people it might, so you just have to ask yourself, do you want the best possible Mario Kart? Or do you want a Mario Kart? You'll still get the core Mario Kart 8 experience for a fraction of the price. But sometimes the best values in gaming aren't always the cheapest. I'm gonna show you how to game on a budget. Right after I show you how to fix a migraine. Listen, just because a game is cheap doesn't mean it's worth it or a great investment in the long run. Sometimes it's best to spend a little bit more to get a far better experience. You can buy 10 games under five bucks a pop and get like 100 hours total playtime, sure, but holy f Is that all entertainment should be? Just whatever nobody else at GameStop wanted? Some amazing games can be picked up this way. But here, I wanna recommend games that I think are worthwhile at full price. Even when you're on a budget, these games can supply you with hundreds of hours of substantial entertainment. Let me clarify. These are just some of my personal picks for games I'd recommend to anybody, even if they're at full price. And that's because they have loads of substantial content. And many of these games take a while to play through, yes. But most of the time is spent on actual stuff. A lot of the longest games of all time achieve that title and nothing else. These are games that aren't just long. They're meaningful experiences. They give you so much more than just something to waste your free time with or something you walk away from and say, that was fun. These are worthy investments, even if you're on a budget. Now, these may not be the cheapest games. You can definitely spend your money on a handful of used titles instead. But in my opinion, if you can only have a few games in your collection, 
These are some that you can't go wrong with. First up. Second up, Super Mario Maker 2 is an obvious pick. I mean, what, is an infinite supply of levels not enough for you? If your answer is no, my god, imagine dating you. Listen, I may not have gotten as into Mario Maker 2 as the first, but that doesn't mean it's a lesser value. Far from it. We've got a full single-player campaign of Nintendo-made stages, which takes about as long as any other modern 2D Mario to finish. The infinite supply of levels available online, plus full as worlds created by users that can honestly stand on their own as entire Mario games in their own right, local and online multiplayer, and obviously the course builder, which you can put thousands of hours in itself if you're the creative type. All else fails, just recreate the old games in the level maker and voila! You got a compilation of the classic Marios on top of everything else. Sure, you need a subscription to access the online content, including all the user-made stages. But I think that's a small price to pay for what's genuinely an endless Mario game. And hey, you get all these extra bonuses with a paid membership, uh, such as the ability to purchase a Sega Genesis controller for $50? Well, aren't I glad I spent money. I can now spend money! The levels in Mario Maker 2 may not be as finely crafted and organic as what you may find in non-course creator platformers like Super Mario Bros. Wonder or Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, but they can still be pretty damn fun. The ingenuity all these creators have is a sight to behold. Uh, taking an already extensive tool set and stretching it farther than you could possibly imagine. This is an incredible value no matter how you look at it. Mario Maker 2 is a total bargain, even at full price. No matter how much you've played, there's always something new to discover here. level of hell. All right, well, this is a list of games that I'd recommend regardless of price. I ain't gonna lie and act like the going rate of Hollow Knight isn't playing a huge factor here. Not only is this already one of the greatest Metroidvanias, it's one of the greatest Metroidvanias costing $15. If $15 takes you this far, imagine what 16 can do. Game compilations can oftentimes be hit or miss when it comes to value. Uh, sure, it's nice to have a collection of like-minded titles available in one package, but sometimes there's not enough improvements, extra features, and price-wise, it just might be better to buy the games individually. However, I think these right here are some of the greatest bundles of content ever on offer. Now, I already gushed about Rare Replay and Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, but how about the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection, all right? 13 Street Fighter games, four featuring online play, and all these extra additions make this a pretty great value for casual players. Kingdom Hearts All-in-One Package features nearly everything Kingdom Hearts up until Kingdom Hearts 3. Sure, a few games here are just represented via cutscenes, but I don't think it's a huge loss. Aw, oh, damn, no, that? It includes everything it needs to, and I think that still makes for an excellent collection. The God of War Saga and Metal Gear Legacy collection for PS3? <laughs> These were so damn good, but they just had to include download codes for some of the games which have all expired by this point. I was considering recommending Spider-Man Miles Morales since the Ultimate Edition came with Spider-Man Remastered, but damn it! Why do all these collections do this? Like, I can't in good conscience give Mega Man Legacy Collection 1 and 2 on Switch my endorsement. Its download code will eventually expire. Well, that leaves us with Halo The Master Chief Collection. All six games looking better than ever, the full campaigns, the online multiplayer. This is a case where all of these on the original consoles would be a bit cheaper, but the improvements brought in here and the online play being available and active makes this worth it by comparison, in my opinion. There's so many great compilations out there, so this is just scratching the surface. Three mobile games in one? That's more than two! Shovel Knight Treasure Trove. Hot damn! It's five games in one! Originally released as just Shovel Knight at a cool 15 bones in 2014, it was already a stellar deal. But over the next five years, they kept adding junk to the point where we have four campaigns with different characters and a pretty expansive multiplayer fighting mode. All as free updates. Uh, eventually, they had to go... F 
It was genuinely too much to offer for just 15, so the price went up to 40, with each portion of the game being available separately if you just want to play one of the campaigns. But 40 is still really damn good for what you get here. Also, if you bought the game for 15 back in the day, that's all you had to pay for. You never had to pay an extra fee to get any of this. This and Mario Maker 2 are some of the best bang for your buck 2D platformers. But Leps World 2 is free! Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition. This game is repetitive as hell, just button mashing mush with Zelda frosting. If I'm gonna recommend this, I might as well recommend you just spam your keyboard because you'll get a similar amount of enjoyment out of that as you would with Hyrule Warriors. Man, Warriors games are just dumb fun. Uh, they can get tedious for sure, but zoning out and just plowing through enemies when you get in the groove, they are so relaxing. That or it may just be extremely lethargic. Regardless, Hyrule Warriors is pretty good, but you take what's a pretty good game and flood it with content, and now it becomes a pretty good game flooded with content. There's so much stuff. Stuff here! The Definitive Edition on Nintendo Switch features all content from both the Wii U and 3DS games, which includes multiple modes to plow through, nearly 30 playable characters, hundreds upon hundreds of hours of content here. This game never ends! It's the perfect title to just pick away at over time. I don't think this is the only game you should have if you're playing literally nothing but this. But as a supplemental game, you pop in from time to time, this will genuinely last you forever. This right here, I'd consider to be the definitive collection of open world games. Grand Theft Auto V, Red Dead Redemption 2, The Witcher 3, Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, Elden Ring, and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and or Tears of the Kingdom. You can't go wrong with any or all of these, frankly. I think each brings some unique spunk the others don't have. Uh, lots of different themes, time periods, and gameplay styles on display here. You can't beat GTA when it comes to sandboxing around. Even when you've exhausted all possibilities with the game, you haven't. And that's in addition to GTA Online, which is the sole reason why many even buy Grand Theft Auto to begin with. The Witcher 3 is one of the most expansive open world RPGs ever crafted, being more story focused and cinematic than something like Skyrim, which I'd say is more about going off and making your own adventure. Which, hey, both are excellent. If anything, that means you should get them together if possible. Elden Ring's probably the most unique of the bunch, considering you don't really have a waypoints or much of a plot stringing things along. It's just one big ass world with dungeons and enemies and boss fights throughout. Just pick a direction and you're immediately tossed into some of the most engaging gameplay out there. It's a dangerous, genuine adventure where no encounter is mindless. Which is why we have both. Red Dead 2 and Metal Gear 5 are stellar as well, but when it comes to Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom, I mean, these are two of my favorite games of all time, and there's still hundreds of hours of content in both I haven't touched yet. But recommending only one is tricky. I mean, Tears of the Kingdom has far more content, but I feel its impact is lessened if you don't experience Breath of the Wild prior. It's probably the better pick though, so if you had to go with one, pick up Tears of the Kingdom. This is one of the defining examples of what an open world game could be and should be. These titles are some of the meatiest you can buy. They can last you a lifetime while delivering some of the most worthwhile and memorable gaming moments you will ever experience. <laughs> Puyo Puyo Tetris 2. Now, why would I buy this when I can just keep grinding away at the free demo? Well, Puyo Puyo Tetris 2, in my opinion, is one of, if not the best puzzle game out there. The, surely the best Tetris and Puyo Puyo game at the very least. Because not only can you enjoy this as just a Tetris game or just a Puyo Puyo one, but you get a full on single player campaign and so many different special modes combining the two games. Online multiplayer, local multiplayer. This is like the perfect puzzle package. 
uh, just a great game to play when you're in the mood for something like this. I am in the mood for something like, like this. RPGs, where, are normally some of the longer video games out there, taking dozens of, if not hundreds of hours to complete. And while I'm not the most into the genre, I definitely know some good ones when I see them, which is why my eyes are perpetually closed. But here we are, Persona 5 Royal, Dragon Quest XI S, Baldur's Gate 3. These games are all damn rich in content and depth. Uh, Persona 5, 40 hours in, you're still getting tutorials. There's also Dragon Quest Builders 2 for a bit of an RPG and Minecraft hybrid, uh, World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy XIV Online if you want massively multiplayer online RPGs and genuinely nothing else out of life. But there, those are my RPG recommendations. <laughs> Of course a Super Smash Brothers has to be here. I mean, look at all this stuff. Nearly every game in the franchise has unlimited replay value in the multiplayer department and an extensive amount of single player content. If I had to pick one game to play until the end of time, well, I would surely be wise to make that a Smash Brothers. Surely. But which one? Well, Smash Brothers Ultimate has the most content, the most fighters, stages, music, the works. But then my eyes start to wander to previous entries. I mean, Brawl has a full story mode with CGI cutscenes and levels to explore, whereas Ultimate has this 20 to 30 hour slog of an adventure mode consisting of nothing but fights with barely any cutscenes and this JPEG of a map to wander around on. You had game demos in Brawl, full 3D trophies, stickers, albums, put the stickers in. The coin launcher game, target test, stage builder with all these different parts to use. Oh, we have a full list of all Nintendo published games included just because. In comparison, Ultimate is far more focused on the core content, the stuff that matters. But that honestly makes everything surrounding it a bit lackluster. I do think Brawl has the better single player offerings. But at the end of the day, who f***ing cares? I can talk to death about how much I liked Coin Launcher, but it's f***ing Coin Launcher. Smash Ultimate is the one to get. Doesn't mean it's perfect, doesn't mean it has everything I'd want out of a Smash game, but I'd be a fool for acting like it isn't the ultimate Smash Brothers. You know, ultimate f***ing Smash Brothers without Coin Launcher, I mean, sure. I could go all day with this. I mean, so many indie games are an absurd value. Uh, Hades, Spelunky 2, Binding of Isaac, Stardew Valley. I think Sonic Mania is a steal. There's the classic Doom games that are like five bucks a pop. That's crazy. Then there's all the Sim games out there. Uh, Sim City, The Sims, Roller Coaster Tycoon, Zoo Tycoon, the Animal Crossing series. Uh, the Civilization games are infinitely replayable. Uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled are packed kart racers. And of course, Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics. And you know what? It barely crossed the 50 Worldwide Classics minimum to be considered a good deal. But like I said, this has all been just my perspective, which is the tricky thing about budget gaming recommendations. There's pros and cons to everything, so it always depends on your preferences. Now, I could tell you all day to buy games from one to two generations back for great experiences at dirt cheap prices. But you probably don't want to do that. You want the latest and greatest. Uh, well, then Gamefly or Xbox Game Pass might be good for you. Uh, but no, you want to actually own these games. Well, make sure you're following social media accounts hell-bent on alerting you when sales pop up. Oh, but you don't want to be scouring the internet all the time for deals. What do you want from me? There are always options out there. You may have to be a bit creative. You may have to be patient, but no matter what games you're into, there are always effective ways to save while playing what you want. And if you can't get what you want right now, then making do with what's available can open yourself up to amazing experiences you wouldn't have had otherwise. And hey, by the time you're done with those, the game you wanted in the first place may be cheaper now. Patience is key to gaming on a budget. Which is crazy because throughout the past 50 minutes, I've been taking advantage of these tips all at once and I've been able to rebuild my game collection in record time. It's crazy how quickly I did that. It's also crazy how quickly the collections agency found my address. Hey all, Scott here. What do you do when you wanna play games but you're on a budget? Find a new hobby. One of my favorite pastimes as a kid was to go to the dollar store. I live in Ohio, your hobby's either that or getting shot. Listen, it was all about walking in there with $5 and leaving it with a weekend. I'll buy Silly String there, that was so 
fucking funny. I spent the only dollar I had on a whoopee cushion and wanted to let the world know, so I stomped on it and wasted one dollar. Then there was the ice cream section and all the office supplies, the snacks. I would buy banquet meals there, and we know that because I'll be dead in three years. I think I really liked it because for a kid on a $20 a week allowance without having to save up, the dollar store was where I could splurge. But what made the dollar store magical was seeing products there that you didn't always associate with being cheap. Movies, either on DVD or VHS, yeah, when those were there, that was pretty cool. Hell, even now, like, looking through the movies on display, these are some pretty big name modern flicks. Many times these stores would just have really old, mediocre, and forgotten DVDs, but now when I see a modern movie for sale at Dollar General, you get why you hear this. Movies would usually cost five bucks a pop, maybe 10 if they were feeling racy. I mean, in my neck of the woods, we have Dollar General, Family Dollar, and Dollar Tree. Only one of these sticks to the everything's a dollar or less ideology. Son of a bitch! Even my beloved Five Below, as deserted as it is, they've always stuck to the mentality of everything at their store is five dollars or below. But then they increased it to 10? Where are the protesters? Doesn't even matter because they're selling stuff for 20 now. It is nothing sacred anymore. But hey, these stores focus on selling goods for cheap, which makes finding normally more premium products there exciting. Video games have always been a more expensive form of entertainment, and with DVD and CD players being more widespread than specific game consoles, it's obvious why dollar stores would focus more on those than this. You can't just have PlayStation games in stock. You need Xbox, Nintendo, PC. It gets to a point where you just say, just sell that. However, that doesn't mean video games are never at these places. You just have to hunt for them. So let's go on a journey and see what kind of games we can get at stores that just flat out barely sell video games. First up, Dollar General. You may know them as one of the most popular low-end variety stores in the country. I know them as a place where they display condoms in a Ninja Turtles underwear box. I remember a specific game I bought at Dollar General when I was a kid. Nicktoons Winner's Cup Racing for the PC. Scott, you're so f***ing cool. Tell us more. See, I think if they feel comfortable selling anything in dollar stores, it's PC games and software. Everybody owns my worst f***ing nightmare. It was like 10 bucks. It was a video game, and I love Nickelodeon. Everything was adding up to this being Scott's best investment yet. It never worked. Of course, this was Scott's 2007 Windows Vista PC, which put him right on the track to why you don't give a shit about him, but this game never worked. It wouldn't boot past the installation screen. I guess it was a sequel to Nicktoons Racing, or a dequel? Like, Jesus Christ, no wonder this was a Dollar General. How is this a game from 2006? Well, I guess I wasn't missing out on much with this title, but seeing a video game at a store like this, though, I think the rush alone was more than worth the asking price. That's why people love Adderall! But nowadays, I can find actual video games at Dollar General. Like, uh, FIFA 16, Angry Birds Star Wars, Angry Birds Star Wars, Mighty Number no. 9. Don't lie, you'd also say, Oh boy! Video games! Now why these games specifically? Why are they at the dollar store and are basically the only games at the dollar store? Well, I've been to enough f***ing pigsties to understand. Uh, see, I think dollar stores generally buy off the unsold stock of bigger stores. Whatever Walmart doesn't eat, Five Below will clean its plate. I mean, look at all this and tell me this isn't just a clearance bin. So, whatever. Dollar General will buy pallets worth of games that nobody could sell, so they probably got them for an insanely low price, and BAM! Video games at Dollar General. Well, let's see if I can get my... $10 out of FIFA 16. You guys couldn't have spent the big bucks and nab FIFA 17? Well, it is an Xbox One game I bought at the dollar store. $9 more than it's worth. I'm not even sure if this is brand new. Dollar General does this thing where like, what the hell, why is it printed on the cover? What about Angry Birds Star Wars on the 3DS? Uh, interesting system choice, but the game makes sense. This title is an amalgamation of two things mom knows your kid kinda likes, but that's the extent of it. So BAM! Buy their Christmas present here, why don't ya? So these two games are kinda typical, everybody knows them type games. They were cheap to get, so out of all video games, these make the most sense rotting here. And then there's Mighty Number no. 9. F I mean, why do you go to the dollar store? That's what I thought. It's obvious Mighty Number no. 9 didn't sell well because it's Mighty Number no. 9. Angry Birds Star Wars definitely didn't sell well as it was 50 damn dollars at launch. And FIFA 16, I assume there was just a big surplus left over once FIFA 17 came out. Thus, both FIFA and Mighty are going for less than $10 brand new these days. Though Angry Birds Star Wars, we got a seven cent discount. So out of these three, you're either getting fucked over, fucked over, or fucked over. For the family on a budget, could I see them getting their money's worth out of these games? Technically, sure. But if you're on a budget, get the hell out of here. If you want a cheap soccer game, honey, walk into a thrift store. For an Angry Birds game, they're free.
free. And then Mighty Number no. 9. You know, it's not like unbelievably bad. It just has cheap as hell production value and incredibly mediocre design. But if this was your only game as a kid, it would probably suffice. But there are so many other options for gaming on a budget. Dollar stores give you the illusion of a deal when half the time the prices are more expensive there than other places. You just don't notice because you're distracted by the fact you're in a dollar store. Holy f look at the price in that milk. But one thing I always remember seeing at Dollar General was the At Games consoles for only $40. This is the Dollar General exclusive edition with baseball included. I know, right? These plug and play systems, my jaw dropped when I saw them here. This was before retro gaming merchandise became as prevalent as it is today, so seeing Intellivision, ColecoVision, hell, Sega Genesis at a store like this was intense. Hey, this thing that you like that nobody's ever heard of? Yeah, here it is for sale in the most general, general store of them all. These are all done by At Games, Walgreens Made of Honor. They would produce cheap plug and play systems based on retro consoles and sell them in stores like this. Stores that don't normally sell games where the people roaming it would stop and say, hey, I remember that, and blow $40 on this thing they plug in once and never again. The Intellivision Classic Game Console. Like I said, this one proudly proclaims it's the Dollar General Exclusive Edition coming with baseball. I will give it to him. It's designed pretty similarly to the original, but this one is so much more flimsy. Like if I crack it over my knee. Like what the f even the AV cables feel like the person making them had a gun pointed at them. Just cheap and rushed. When you open it up, like, this box should contain eggs, not in television. I mean, what do you expect from a Dollar General console? I don't know, but I don't expect to be spending $40 on a Dollar General console. The Intellivision and Coleco systems are cute. Being more obscure consoles with unique controllers from the late 70s, early 80s makes these some of the better and easier ways to experience these games. As much as it pains me to say, Intellivision games need this controller but I don't, I swear. Trying to play these on a compilation like Intellivision lives on the Xbox is putrid. So these little guys have some worth. I don't know what they're doing here though. You must have the thickest crotch in the world if you're willing to bet an estranged ColecoVision owner is walking into a Dollar General. Like, oh, I remember this. Well, nobody remembers you. The Sega Genesis classic game console makes a lot more sense. This is one of the most iconic retro systems out there. It was also $40, which I think just made these absolutely hilarious. Oh yeah, this one has dozens upon dozens of games like Sonic the Hedgehog and Mortal Kombat. Baseball. This that game Sega Genesis console isn't good, but it isn't great either. All right, I do think this thing always got a bit too much hate. People will criticize how the emulation is off and the sound stinks. Half the games are literally just no name whatever things that are like electronic versions of games you get on the back of cereal boxes. But this wasn't meant for people like us who notice or care about this. I've seen numerous people buy stuff like, oh, this Pac-Man plug and play game console and go, this reeks, the emulation smells bad. Also consider the fact these products are made for 50 year olds who wouldn't notice if you stab them while playing this game, let alone the sound being pitched slightly up. I don't wanna defend the poor quality, but the fact is any of us who are complaining about these systems already have far better methods of playing these games. The target audience for these things would never notice or even care. But to be fair, this thing is jam packed with Genesis games, even including the Mortal Kombat's, which is a really nice touch. The games play okay, they aren't amazing here, but for the amount of titles you get for a $40 impulse buy at the dollar store, this ain't the worst thing out there. I always found it really cool it accepts original Genesis cartridges, especially considering it made it 100% correct to say, I bought a Sega Genesis from Dollar General. The quality of this was never great, but it does the bare minimum. I think $40 is too much, but for 20, I think that's fair. It's just an incredibly mediocre product, but does have some worth. Yeah. This is a Dollar General video game haul. I can't say that you wouldn't get time out of these purchases, but keep in mind, this all cost me over $150, which is why let's move straight on over to the gaming related products at Dollar General. We have various hardcore gaming products for the aspiring gamer. Who the hell wants to be a gamer? D just do it. That's like saying, oh, I want to be unemployed. Outside of buying Halo and Call of Duty related toys, Doritos with a Call of Duty promotion, and gamer gear, uh, there's not much else we can really do at Dollar General video game wise. Family Dollar, anyone? The box is here. They can't be far. You know, the more I go into Family Dollars, the more I question my motives. They did sell video games here. I know they did. I saw them selling nothing but 20 copies of Disney Infinity 3.0 game only for Wii U. 
That doesn't work! Not only are you playing with fire selling Wii U games in 2021, but you have the crotch to sell a game that doesn't work without accessories and nothing but that? Well, Five Below fares a bit better here. They almost always have a video game section. Like, what do you call that? Jackpot. Five Below similarly has the video games that wouldn't sell elsewhere. Currently, the selection is Starlink, Battle for Atlas for PS4, Darksiders 2 for Xbox 360, and FIFA 20 and Elder Scrolls Online for Xbox One, all at $5 a pop. Son of a bitch. Now, Starlink is another Toys to Life game like Disney Infinity, though I think it makes more sense here considering the game can be played without the toys, uh, much like how Guitar Hero can be played without the guitar. That doesn't mean it's worth much on its own. Darksiders 2 for Xbox 360? Like I have biting analysis for why this is here. You know, I frequent this fight below and they always have Darksiders 2. They used to have Birthday Party Bash on Wii and Darksiders 2. Now they just have Darksiders 2. Well, we know it's more in demand now. FIFA 20, okay, how is 25 here and 1610 there? Then finally, Elder Scrolls Online. They give this away in Happy Meals at this point. Most online only games are like this. They plummet in value, especially when new versions and expansions come out. I know Battleborn was a hot ticket item at Five Below. Now it's unplayable. And I bet some Five Belows are still selling it. But I, there was a time a few years back where Nintendo games made their way over here. Yeah, never priced my games below two grand Nintendo. They never priced drop, which made these games popping up here absolutely shocking. I saw Yokai Watch, Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer, The Legend of Zelda, Triforce Heroes, all here $5 a piece. And then 10 copies of Star Fox Zero because 11 was too much. And I, say what you will about these games. Okay, I hate Star Fox Zero. But for $5, brand new copies, that's a steal. And I mean, I've seen Guitar Hero Live and Skylanders Imaginators on Wii U here for five bucks a pop, brand new in the original box. Animal Crossing Amiibo, same price. There can be some actually good deals here. Just don't quit your day job waiting for them. So what was the point of this? Well, I always found it interesting to see how stores like these treat video games. As a kid, I always found it incredibly exciting to see video games at a store that didn't usually sell stuff like that. Uh, going to GameStop was a luxury back then. I only really went when my parents were going to a different store that was nearby GameStop. So to see these products as lame as they are at stores that I went to more frequently, there's this really neat feeling about it that is really hard to describe. However, it's obvious dollar stores are more interested in selling prepaid phones than Nintendo Switch games. Okay. Though you can still get video game related merchandise at these stores. Like Five Below sells a lot of pro gamer gear. Dollar Tree, they sold a Fortnite sticker album. No stickers included. Uh, what else did they sell me? Authentic casino played cards. Uh, pills and Donald Duck Lemonade. There's something always fun about seeing what these stores deem as sellable. But let's disregard dollar stores for a bit. Let's talk discount pharmacies. You ever go to Rite Aid? Oh, you could always find video games at Rite Aid. And I found some local. So first up, we have Dance Sensation on Wii for $19.99. Puss in Boots on Wii for $19.99. Build-A-Bear Workshop Friendship Valley for $19.99. Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings on Nintendo DS for $19.99. And Bakugan Battle Brawlers on Wii for $14.99 discount. All together with tax, this cost me roughly over $100 at Rite Aid, and I found all these video games brand new sealed on eBay for $46. I'll stick to FIFA. Hey y'all, Scott here. One man's trash is another man's garbage. What makes a video game a good deal? Well, it's subjective. I don't know why you wrote big fangs, but I can't say you're wrong. But it's good to know your limits, what the bare minimum kind of product you'd buy at a certain price is. If I'm gonna buy a game for $70, well, it's gotta have this, or I'm not budging. But many don't seem to understand how, just because they won't buy anything with the letter B in it, that doesn't mean I abide by their logic. Either way, I'm safe. It's entirely up to each individual how they spend their money. If you want to buy The Last of Us Part 1 on PlayStation 5, yeah, I mean, there's worse ways to spend $70. Here, take my money. So then what do I consider good deals and bad deals in gaming? Well, to truly understand, we need examples. And if we don't get examples, we'll make examples. 
After over a decade of $60 being the norm for the standard blockbuster video game, with the introduction of the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series consoles, we saw that price increase by $10. Oh no, my gordita crunch money! Hey, listen, I ain't opposed to $70 video games, or how much time you get out of these things, that's still a fine value. It cost me $15 to see Dumbo, and I still haven't made back that investment. But the games they chose to be some of the first with that standardized price... It's the same goat I've seen every day for a nickel. I'll give them 9,000 today. You'd expect games like Forza Horizon 5, Resident Evil Village, Guardians of the Galaxy, Elden Ring to maybe be $70, but no. Demon's Souls, a remake of a PlayStation 3 game from 2009 that launched at $60, a part of the same lineup of games from the same developer as Elden Ring, which retailed at $60. Oh, I'm sorry, the chef is out. He made all the sense around here. Again, $70 games, I'm fine with. I mean, have you seen the prices of games from the 90s? Mortal Kombat Trilogy on Nintendo 64 was 75, and you know why they went lower? The cash register can't hold that much money. Well, game prices were the way they were back then due to how much technology had to be crammed into these game cartridges, many of which had unique hardware included in order to achieve maximum, here you go. So yeah, when you have to specially produce chips to put inside each and every game, that'll drive up the cost. Though with the transition to discs, those you didn't have to do that with. Just order a pack of blank CDs from Big Lots and you're set. Those were cheaper to mass produce, thus games got a fairly standardized price during the PlayStation 2 days of 50 bones. That increased to 60 with the Xbox 360 era and moving into the PlayStation 5 generation, now we have to pay 70 for some of the biggest $10 games. The Last of Us Part 1, a 2022 remake of a game from 2013 that received a remaster in 2014 retailing for 70 US dollars. Why is this so expensive? Because the toxins released spending $70 are far healthier than burning it. This is what I'd consider to be a bad deal in gaming, all right? Let's just use this chart here to compare all releases of The Last of Us. In 2013, you got the initial release for $60, considered game of the year by millions, one of the best stories told in all of gaming alongside incredibly tightly designed gameplay. And that's just the single player campaign. You got multiplayer as well, plus a downloadable single player prequel for an extra $15. The original 2013 release was well worth it in every sense of the word, if you say it really fast. But with the title releasing within the final year of the PlayStation 3's life before the PlayStation 4 took over, those who didn't already have the console weren't super willing to invest in one. Thus, one year later, The Last of Us Remastered for PlayStation 4 launched for $50. Improved visuals, frame rate, the DLC is included in the package, free of charge. Plus, there's a new photo mode, features utilizing the PlayStation 4 controller. This isn't the most exciting remaster, but it was a necessary one giving the PlayStation 4 user base the chance to play one of the greatest games of all time in the most definitive way possible at a discounted price that would continue to drop over time. Eight years later. Uh, this game better look like Satan's worst nightmare. It looks like you just had a bad dream. The Last of Us Part 1 is a remake of the 2013 game a remaster like the 2014 game, and putting them all side by side, wow, you can tell. To be fair, during the cutscenes and other in-game moments, the differences can be more drastic than you think. Uh, they truly did rebuild this game, but a lot of the differences feel like just that. Not necessarily an upgrade, just it looks different now. Going from the original PS3 game to part one on PS5 is a huge step up. But from remastered on PS4, like there should have been a bonus feature in part one, a fucking bird that tells you when something's different. If anything, they took more stuff out with the exclusion of the multiplayer mode. And yes, the game looks better now, but The Last of Us Remastered still looks better than 90% of the games releasing these days, and you can play that on PlayStation 5. And how many times can they keep just enhancing graphics on a game and expect people to care? There's one more pixel on the screen in The Last of Us Part 1 too. Well, there is more content. Yeah, hopefully it's obvious why I think that's a bad deal, though I can understand why some people have no problem spending that kind of cash on this kind of game. What you spend your money on is your own damn business. Until the government gets involved. I, I guarantee the people who complain about this just bought the stupidest goddamn thing ever.
This is why I guarantee it. Blizzard Arcade Collection, a handful of games developed by Blizzard before they changed their mind on going bankrupt. A solid little retro distraction with some cool bonus features and variations of the games included, they actually went in and created definitive versions of these Super Nintendo games, combining elements from other console versions into one, which is awesome. For $20, this is a great way to play these vintage games. One problem, these games were available for free on Blizzard's website. Well, not really free, they cost the guilt of not buying the arcade collection. Now, let's be fair here. The versions of the Lost Vikings and Blackthorn Blizzard has available on their website are the DOS versions, and Rock and Roll Racing is more of a cut down demo of the full game with loads of content missing. The arcade collection contains the console versions of these games, plus the definitive editions, which have loads of value to them. Plus later on, they released a free update putting two games that aren't on Blizzard's website for free in the collection. I think the initial thought of, oh, they're releasing a collection of games for $20 when they're also offering PC PC downloads of the games included for free, what a crock is understandable, but they included a lot more than those free versions ever will. And it's not like they removed the free downloads after they released Arcade Collection, so this, I wouldn't say it's a bad deal, though I wouldn't say it's a necessarily good one either, especially when it initially launched with only three titles. I'd say this is wholeheartedly an eh deal. But that just begs the question, what do I consider a good deal in gaming? I stole this. When the second Dreamcast was doing really bad, like pretty bad really bad, a deal was offered where if you signed up for Sega's online service, SegaNet for $22 a month on a two year plan, you'd get a Dreamcast console, you just get one. I mean, you get a free video game console by signing up for a service you'd possibly sign up for once you buy said video game console. It's like, sure, I'll sign up for PlayStation Plus and then they give you a whole last PlayStation 5. Like, hey, I wouldn't complain, but this tactic seems backwards. You'd expect if there would be any deal, you'd get the online service for free after buying the console, not getting the console for free after buying the online service. But hey, I'd be an ass for saying this is anything but a good deal. Oh wow, f this guy. It goes without saying though, you can't do a deal like this without vibes of an oh f mentality. And within a few months, Sega announced the deal didn't work. But a good deal is still a good deal, even if it's born out of a company on the verge of bankruptcy. It's our duty as consumers to take advantage of others' misery, even our own. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Anniversary Edition on Nintendo Switch for $70. Here's a picture of that, and here's a picture of something not worth $70. Well, this was just a waste of ink. Forget The Last of Us on PlayStation 5 for $70. How about Skyrim on Switch for that price? I mean, the $70 price transition was pretty much exclusively for those new consoles introduced. The Switch was still sitting pretty with a $60 price cap for most games. But let's roll out the red carpet for another damn version of Skyrim. To be fair, this is a bundle. The base Skyrim game for $60, plus the Anniversary Edition DLC upgrade, which would normally cost $20 standalone. Now only 10 via this method. Now the DLC itself, I mean, this Anniversary Edition originally launched alongside the PS5 and Xbox Series versions of Skyrim in November of 2021, being offered as an upgrade on top of another upgrade. It came to Nintendo Switch out of nowhere a year later and includes new content. Well, they ain't kidding. For $20, this is incredibly weak DLC. It's a bunch of items and gear, some quests. I mean, decent enough add-on content, but for $20? On top of the 60 for the base Skyrim game, which is $10 more than the superior special edition on the other more powerful consoles, an anniversary edition doesn't even come alongside any next-gen upgrades like it did on PS5, which kind of warranted the release of anniversary edition to begin with. But hey, anniversary edition on Switch does improve the graphics slightly, and now the game runs worse than it did without the DLC. God, after that, I need something slightly more positive. Well, I did say slightly. Super Mario 3D All-Stars, a compilation of Super Mario 64, Sunshine, and Galaxy on Nintendo Switch for $60. Now, due to a lack of bonus features and other games included, many considered this to be overpriced. Well, let's do some math here. When Nintendo sold Nintendo 64 and Wii games on the Wii U's Nintendo eShop, they valued Super Mario 64 at $10 and Super Mario Galaxy at $20. And while they didn't sell GameCube games, we could do some quick math and figure they'd sell Super Mario Sunshine for 15. <laughs> Nintendo wouldn't do this to me. We are really close. We talk all the time. Hi, this is Nintendo customer support. 
Hi, my DS won't turn on. Well, this price accounts for the baseline, just the game experience for the most part. 3D All-Stars enhances the games. If you squint, Mario 64 got the least attention here. <laughs> you could compare it to the standalone Wii U release, and that one you could save and load suspend points whenever you wanted. <laughs> you can't do that here. Though the game looks and controls far better in 3D All-Stars, and it's interestingly based on a Japan-only release of the game, now including rumble support. Sunshine is now in widescreen with an increased resolution, Galaxy can now be played with a standard controller, and all games can be played portably, which you could warrant a price increase for that on paper. That's not a feature of the game, that's a feature of the Nintendo Switch. If you list portability as a feature of a Switch game, th th what are you doing? The Xbox version of this game is more expensive because it has the feature of using an Xbox controller to play it. The bonus content is pitiful in this collection. Basically just the soundtracks of the three games, a feature that was included because no thought had to be put into it. At the end of the day, the considering everything that's been included and the enhancements to each game, the value of this collection to me is around 50 to $55, which when it retail for 60, I don't really think that's anything to freak out about. If you're somebody who refuses to pay a couple bucks more than what you think the imaginary value of a product is, you're probably fucking awesome. Which means you would love Gears of War Ultimate Edition on Xbox One, a $40 remaster of Gears of War on Xbox 360. I only have $5 but I just found out taking out a loan is free. For a series with four entries on the same console, you'd expect to see a Gears of War collection for that price. Just remastering the first game feels like something's missing here. Well, lucky us, Microsoft included the Xbox 360 versions of all these titles for free, playable on Xbox One, even the first game. Oh man, I always wanted to play that. I mean, Gears of War Ultimate Edition is a good remaster, though with how readily available the first game was and how the other games weren't initially included, I'd say this was originally an eh deal. Though after they ran this promotion, it became a damn good one. It only lasted from August 2015 to December 2015, but hey, if you have a problem with that, take it up with the passage of time. Ha, <laughs> wanna hear another bad deal in gaming? Mass Effect 3 Special Edition for Wii U. Why did I buy this? Because it's special, and what makes it special is I f***ed up all by myself. A launch title for Wii U, the third entry in the Mass Effect series, a series of games that really benefits from playing each entry to move your save file over from one to another. Of course, Mass Effect 1 was only on Xbox 360, so when Mass Effect 2 released on PlayStation 3, they incorporated an interactive comic that enabled you to cruise through an abridged Mass Effect 1 story and make the decisions you would have made that could alter how your story goes in Mass Effect 2. But then they eventually released Mass Effect Trilogy on Xbox 360, 360 and PS3, bundling all games together while also putting Mass Effect 1 out on PlayStation for the first time. That launched during the holiday of 2012 for $59.99. Mass Effect 3 Special Edition launched on Wii U that same holiday for $59.99. Okay, well, it's Special Edition. There's gotta be something special special about it. That's not special, Funky Barn's on it too. Sure, you get a new interactive comic, a bunch of the DLC is included, plus the M597 Landon weapon. It's only in the Wii U version. You know what else is only in the Wii U version? A good reason to buy Mass Effect 3. But they couldn't bother to price this game at like, at least $50? Bringing the trilogy over would take three times the work. This game was so cheap on the other platforms because on Xbox 360, it was a matter of putting discs in cases. And on PlayStation 3, they just had to bring over the original Mass Effect and that's it. So I get why this bundle didn't come to Wii U. But why was it the same damn price? Ooh, well, Wii U gamepad functionality. Yeah, because doing this playing Mass Effect 3 feels badass. <laughs> The button hurt my finger. That's not to say the Wii U had no good deals. Uh, take a look at Bayonetta 2. That launched with the entire first game on a disc included for free. And they had to port the whole game to Wii U. It's not like Mass Effect Trilogy where they just threw the old discs in the package. No, they just understood how Bayonetta 1 was never on Nintendo platforms and with Bayonetta 2 being a Wii U exclusive, well, what better way to sell people on that than include the first game 
for free. Okay, well, I'm out of ideas. They continued this tradition when the game was re-released on Nintendo Switch, this time with a download code for Bayonetta 1 included. Will always be a good deal. I mean, 16 characters included for free? Best I could do is 15. Nintendo Land included in the Wii U Deluxe set? That's a $60 value for only $50 more than the basic one. Getting one of four free games with Mario Kart 8 around launch? The titles like Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, Kirby and the Rainbow Curse, Yoshi's Woolly World, and Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze all retailing for less than $60? Nintendo was handing out some pretty solid deals during this generation. But then, it happened. In the era of the Nintendo Switch, Nintendo wasn't too interested in cutting consumers a deal. Case in point, the Switch version of Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. $50 on Wii U when it released as a brand new video game, discounted to 20 in 2016, Nintendo Switch version releases in 2018 for 60. What did they add to this version? The goddamn Pope? Okay, so what's the problem again? Well, outside of a new playable character, Funky Kong, which is basically just an easy mode, Tropical Freeze on Switch features less choppy loading screens when entering a level and a new snout. F $60, they should charge monthly for this. Tropical Freeze is truly one of the greatest games of all time. The Nintendo Switch version is the best out there. And in a vacuum, it's worth $60. There is $60 worth of an experience here, but when it launched at 50 and was discounted to 20 and then this version comes out at 60 with barely anything new added, I'm sorry. It feels like these companies try to lure you in with a good deal, then eventually just rip everything from you because eh, they already got you. PlayStation Plus and Xbox Live Gold. You'd sign up for these to play online multiplayer, but as a bonus, you'd get free games every month. For $60 a year, most people were okay with that for online multiplayer alone. Adding a handful of free games on top of that? That's just icing on the cake. The cake is nails. Yeah, that price for online multiplayer alone is a bit much, which is why all these incentives are being thrown in to keep customers happy. Like removing the need for an Xbox Live Gold subscription to access Netflix on Xbox consoles. That's incentive. But I'll gladly take a few free games a month for doing nothing. Look at this lineup of content from the month of March in 2020. The Batman the Enemy Within, Shantae Half-Genie Hero, Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2, Sonic Generations? According to Xbox, that's nearly $100 worth of value. Hell, if they offer just these games for the year, you're making your money back on the Xbox Live investment. Damn, if that's the kind of deal we got in March of 2020, then what about in November of 2022? Thank you? It's really hard to complain considering you're paying for online multiplayer and the games are a bonus, but what the hell is this? Obviously a service like Xbox Game Pass is where a lot of the real value lies. I mean, access to hundreds of games for a monthly price? I'm not specifying because it depends on where you sign up for the service. Buy a f ton of Pop-Tarts, it's free. But that's what it comes down to. Do you value what the product is giving enough to warrant paying what they're asking for? Or do you just want to slime yourself around the price? The value of games is completely subjective. Just because I don't find a game to be a good deal doesn't mean you should or shouldn't buy them. Hell, you can find a game to be a bad deal and still buy it. As long as you have the money to spend and your reasoning is, I want that, that's all you really need. But it's still interesting to dissect what you personally find to be worth it. So I ask you to think about it yourself. What do you think is a good eh or bad deal in gaming? And before you say Nintendo customer support is a bad deal, they hung up on me for the fifth time today asking to replace my DS. I know. Hey y'all, Scott here. You know, so many people ask me, where do you get all those games? Yeah, that'll do. This is a used video game. Could you tell? Video game users are disgusting. We have sticky chairs and eat without socks on. So why are video games one of the most prevalent mediums where used products get swapped around? Everybody buys used products from time to time. There's no reason not to. I mean, the guy may have licked it beforehand, but the bread's still good. But for as many used DVDs and books and CDs and clothes and razors you can find on eBay, Amazon, and thrift stores, why are used video games so much more immediately accepted? Yeah, we all buy used versions of these, but I hear so many people say, I bought used clothes, I didn't know that was possible. But video games have always been associated with secondhand buying. Of course you have some secondhand movie and music shops, but you kind of have to specifically look for them. Almost every place that sells video games sells used video games as well. I don't even remember ever getting a used movie or album as a kid, but video games, hell yeah, this one had gum in it. Why are used games so prevalent? And and why won't this come off? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with how expensive video games have always been. Why buy a brand new video game for $60 when you could buy it used for 55 
I can think of a few reasons. But see, you spend 20 hours with a game, and when you're done with it, you're generally done with it. Why not sell it and use that money to buy another game? See, most people, when they've had an experience, they're okay with letting it go to have more experiences. This isn't normal. But when a game changes hands a few times, it's bound to show some wear after a while. And because of that, there are loads of different species of used games. Firstly, we've got the lookalikes. Used games that look nearly indistinguishable from new games. The game case is spotless, everything's included, absolutely no problem whatsoever. So ever. You could eat off of these things. Then we've got the sloppy seconds, games that are generally all together, they look fine enough, but have some slight imperfections. The game case is starting to get chapped, look at this, it looks dehydrated. There might be some crinkles here and there, and some light stuff missing like the manual or any extra inserts, it looks like the last owner used it as a napkin, but it's inoffensive to own. You may get less job offers, but with games like these, who needs them? But looking at the small little imperfections in the game cases, that just makes you ask, how did it get this way? Especially with games that recently came out. You ever see a used copy of a game that released a month ago and it's already on its deathbed? Games just get these random hickeys sometimes. Like, this is my copy of Super Mario 3D World. I've owned it since launch, taking good care of it. It has this for some reason now. My copy of Call of Duty Black Ops on Wii? Not my copy of Call of Duty Black Ops on Wii! One day in 2011, I found it on the floor with this gash in the middle. I did patch it up with tape, and thankfully it was in a spot I could cover up with black sharpie, but these two moments made me realize games are far more fragile than you may expect. Which is odd. Game companies know their products are handled by young children. Children. You'd think they'd use bulletproof paper or something. Because this is just the beginning of the end. Thirdly, there's the frauds. You see them at the store and think, oh, that's looking pretty good, pull it off the shelf and weep. There's something wrong with my WarioWare. If the seller didn't have the original artwork for the game case, they may just print off their own. At least they're making an effort. Sometimes the print quality is actually pretty good and can be misleading. Uh, sometimes I'll pick up a used game and it'll take a while for me to realize this is a lie. And then other times I ask, okay, so you made an effort, but you didn't? Some people use the lowest quality box art scans they can to print off their copy. Sometimes it's not even the official box art, they'll just use whatever pops up on Google first. You can make the argument, oh, they were in a rush, they didn't have time to find the highest quality box art. Then why print box art in the first place? I have a love-hate relationship with these. On one hand, it's good to see people care enough to print off high quality box art, but I don't want printed off box art, I want the real deal. I have a man to be and I won't be that with fake Luigi's Mansion. At least with the shitty box art printouts, I mean, it's beyond obvious it's fake, so there's no fool in here, but like we thought this looked okay. It's more fun to see the box art that's drawn on with Sharpie. It really puts you in the shoes of the last person who owned the game. Like, how did you lose the box art? You kept the case, you kept the disc, the manual. How do you lose the artwork? That almost seems like it's the hardest thing to lose. If the whole case was missing, I'd understand, but the artwork? You'd have to make a conscious decision to get rid of that. And then the stickers, oh God, the stickers. Every used game needs some kind of indication what its price is. It just so happens the only way to do that is to staple it on. Why are stickers on video game boxes the most powerful stickers of all time? Sure, you get the easy peel off ones, but those are few and far between. Most of the time, these things have melted to the plastic. They're impossible to tear off in one go. And even if you do tear it all off, sometimes the sticker juice is left on. It makes the game case stick to all other game cases around it, and then it attracts the world's hair population. You have yourself a sticky case with just a great personality. Even the tiny garage sale stickers can be a pain. They're so small and rip in half so easily when peeling them off. And who the hell ever thought it was a good idea to put stickers right on any paper included on the product? The box art, labels, this cartridge has so much plastic space, but you just had to smack the sticker right here. Why go out of your way to put stickers on the artwork itself instead of just the plastic case? I guess it's to prevent you from swapping price stickers on cases to get a better deal. But who does that? I got the cashier to think they were ringing up apples when they were really ringing up bananas. I just learned an easy way to get stuff on the cheap. Steal it. While peeling stickers off can be therapeutic, I have had one f of a day. I've very rarely seen any used game sellers get stickers right. That's how we get these old cartridge games with torn labels. I assume this is from stickers because if it wasn't, how the hell did it get this way? Listen, I understand some people just don't care about treating dumb plastic bullshit with respect. I get it. It's just in a condition like this, I wonder how could it have possibly accidentally gotten like this? I mean, I remember watching somebody open a game for a birthday present. They open it up and go, nice. They start peeling off the shrink wrap and they didn't realize they were also peeling off the game case itself. Happy birthday. That's like, how does this happen? How does this happen? What about this? What, did you like spill water on your game and you tried to dry it off with a saw? Each used game with a purple heart has a story to tell that'll never know, but sometimes you can make assumptions. Sometimes you get notes left in from the original owner and back in the day, places like Hollywood Video would brand their games like cattle. This is etched in there. There's no way getting around this. But hey, I now know this happened to be a rental video game. See, this is annoying, but also a part of history. I can at least look at this and go, 
cool. But this is never gonna be fixed. With stickers, yeah, this is stupid, but that's where a funny neighbor who smells really bad comes to help. Gugan, you just squirt that all over. Next person that owns this is gonna have the exact same questions I do. What the f happened here? This usually helps get rid of that sticker residue. Now don't get me wrong, I like this, but I would never drink it. It just smells too bad, I, I couldn't. But some stickers are just a bit too tough, much like the Hollywood video branding. There are some stickers that are basically permanently bonded to the plastic. This Microsoft company store purchase sticker falls under the category of neat but go away. Now this was purchased within Microsoft by a Microsoft employee who really wanted to play whacked. That's really cool. Now, why do they need an ass large sticker that's impossible to peel off? I'm trying everything I can here. To be fair, if it's just the case that's the issue, you can almost always swap it out with a better one. The problem is trying to find another one. The first thought is, oh, I'll get an old sports game. Those are in the dollar bin, nobody's buying them. I can harvest that thing for its shell. But they have their own impossible sticker to remove. Most EA Sports titles have this shiny branding that you can peel off, but it's gonna leave a lot of residue. I mean, there are other games to put out of their misery to simply use their cases, but some games, they're too far gone. Thanks, Caden. A lot of people like to label their property. Oh, some games even encourage that. Pokemon Stadium on N64 had this spot to put your name. Uh, weirdly enough, my copy of Pokemon Stadium is clean, but Kirsten just had to write on Pokemon Snap. Now for these, there are a few ways to clean them up. I like using magic erasers, dab it in a bit of water and scrub a bit if it's on plastic. Uh, many times marker comes right off. Now when it's on paper, Welcome to Corp Central. This is all fairly common for used games though. Weirdly enough, a lot of secondhand game stores don't really care about cleaning their games before reselling them. Sometimes they plaster stickers all over the place, sometimes in places that could do a lot of damage, and other times they just don't even use new cases if theirs is all cracked and sad. The thing is, these stores make most of their money off of used games. New games they don't make much of a profit off of. Most of the money made from those go straight back to the publisher. Used games, they just bought from some sap in the store. They can charge whatever they want for them. They can make as much of a profit off of those as they so please. So why do they do this? Yeah, no problem. That gets cleaned, avoid your warranty. Used games are disgusting half of the time in these stores. But even the most disgusting used game of all time doesn't even begin to compare to the worst offender of me seeing something of all time. F out. So sometimes when people sell their used games, all they have is the disc. At least it makes more sense than not having the artwork but having the case. Like, oh man, I need more space. There, some people just prefer having the disc on a spindle. I can never look them in the eye, but hey, that at least makes sense. That saves an unbelievable amount of space. But of course, people who only have loose discs don't take the greatest care of them. Hey, uh, here's that game you wanted back. Uh, <laughs> I, I lost the case. Um, <laughs> I, I left the manual in Reno. Um, uh, I wanted to give you that back. Uh, I wanted to give you back what's rightfully yours. So when am I looking after your daughter? But for some reason, GameStop and various other stores accepted loose games like this. And where do they go? In the GameStop generic cases. They just have the game console's logo, a really off-center age rating. Oh look, it's rated E10+. And a very sloppily typed on title. Who the hell buys these? Who? <laughs> And then for the funkier cases, stuff like the PS4, which those games don't have DVD sized cases, they mold their own and they're the cheapest things imaginable. Why have that attention to detail? Why put PS4 games in these types of cases? Are the kind of people who buy games in the GameStop generic cases really the type of people who would say, this isn't the size of a normal PS4 game? I thought this was a GameStop, not a witch. Why go that extra mile if you're gonna put this in a GameStop case? I might as well just use a regular DVD one. Need for Speed Hot Pursuit on 360. This is a Wii case with a baseball sticker. Okay, you have the GameStop generic case, but you have the original artwork. How did that happen? How do you lose the case, but not the artwork? What about the old GameStop cases? Those were better and worse. Yeah, just some cartoon characters throwing gang signs. The GameCube one has a mom buying a sack for a kid and this same guy, but backwards. Let's see how many problems we can find on this. Okay, so somebody put a sticker on the spine of the artwork, tried ripping it off. This is a GameCube game in a PlayStation 2 case. They still have literally every piece of paper that was included originally for some reason. And worst of all, it's fucking geist. Eventually, the only way you can buy certain games is used. There's no being around that. Sometimes prices can be dirt cheap. Sometimes they can skyrocket above what they originally went for brand new. And if it's a brand new used game, you save $5. I just buy it new at that point. You know, the profits you can make off of used games must be incredible. I mean, look at all these wholesale lots online you can buy. F it, I don't need a house payment. I decided to buy a bunch of mystery used game lots. I have no clue what games are included. This is gonna be fun. 
One of my lots came with an empty jar of minced garlic. Yeah, I guess to package these games tightly in a container, the seller included minced garlic for padding. Well, let's see what we got here. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Yeah, lots like these are basically trying to get rid of used games that have been rotting on game store shelves that would never sell on their own, so they sell them as a part of a 50 NES game lot, and they're nothing more than Oh my god, this lot came with a sealed GameCube game. That looks like ass! This is my first used brand new video game. There were some good gets in here, but most of the time you're playing with fire with these lots. Basically, I now own all the games nobody wanted to own. Now, game companies don't really like used games. They'd vastly prefer if you bought them new. That way, they make money. See, they ain't making anything off of a used game sale. That's all the game store's profit. And we've seen time and time again, companies trying to incentivize people to buy their games brand new. In the latter half of the 360 and PS3's life, there were online passes where if you you wanted to play online multiplayer, you had to input a code you got with new copies of the game. If you bought the game used, it's likely the online pass was already redeemed, so to play online multiplayer, you'd have to pay 10 bucks. Now I see a lot of launch editions, where you get bonuses for buying the game around its launch window or pre-ordering it. However, with digital games, you can't possibly trade those in. Nintendo gets all the money from you buying their games digitally. Sony doesn't have to give a cut to a retailer. Microsoft doesn't have to worry about people buying those digital games used. The war against used games will forever permeate through gaming history. And at least with digital, the companies make more money off of their products, which means they can fund even more great projects in the future or they can give their CEOs four more dollars. Digital is the way of the future. That's just where gaming's heading. And while I don't think physical games will ever leave for good, digital is definitely what most of these companies want. So while used games can be fucking disgusting, they're a part of gaming culture. And I would love to see a digital game do this. I found Dig Dug. Hey y'all, Scott here, and raise your hand if you've been waiting for the Xbox One X for three hours at the wrong store. Yeah, I didn't pick up an Xbox One X, but I did pick up a few games, and yep, I finally bought into consumerism, which isn't that big of a deal. I'm a pretty big pushover. I'll buy into anything a store associate tells me to. Paper or plastic? Uh, I don't need anything. Really, sir? Everybody needs a bag. I'm a Fucking maniac, and I just can't help it, so I'm not looking forward to Black Friday this year. I mean, they had printers for $20 last year, and I'm a sucker I can't resist. Black Friday, also referred to as holy shit, I'm buying that tent day, is a holiday, joining the likes of Cyber Monday, Fat Tuesday, and Ash Wednesday. It's mainly an American thing, but it has crept its way into other countries such as Canada and the UK. Black Friday is the day after Thanksgiving, flopping out deals left and right to initiate some extreme spending. Of course, with so many deals, many retailers get some deals rolling on Thanksgiving itself, which is kind of lame. I mean, it's Thanksgiving, man. Spend that time with your family. Holy sh**! It's Sonic Forces is only $25. Black Friday is mostly known for its deals on electronics, TVs, phones, tablets, and video games. I've bought stuff on Black Friday since 2013, mainly games. 2013, I picked up Grand Theft Auto V and Bioshock Infinite on the Xbox 360 for a grand total of $63.95 on Amazon. These games both released that year, so not bad. 2014 was another strictly Amazon year. I picked up a solid trio of Wii U games, Injustice Gods Among Us, Scribblenauts Unlimited, and Rayman Legends for $47.97 in total. 2015 was the year that I defied all odds and actually went to some brick and mortar stores to buy product on Black Friday. It wasn't that bad. I'd say if you weren't waiting in line to buy a 47 inch TV for $50, Black Friday isn't the worst. It's just walking around a very crowded Best Buy. And at Best Buy specifically, I picked up Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain and Until Dawn for $47.17. Kind of a lame haul to be honest. But then I decided to mosey on over to GameStop. GameStop always has a buy two get one free on used products deal every Black Friday, so you know I had to take full advantage of that bad boy of a deal. I picked up Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing for the 360, Pikmin 2 for the Wii, and Wolfenstein The New Order for the PS4 for a grand total of $62.17. But wait, on Amazon I picked up Dishonored Definitive Edition, Little Big Planet 3, God of War 3 Remastered, Tearaway Unfolded, and Mario Party 10 for $96.50. Wow, Scott, settle down there, you said. Scott responds, get a load of this. 2016, the year Scott gave up. 
I bought an Xbox One S, Christ right? I got it at Target for $250 plus a $50 gift card that, get this, I used on a paper shredder. I booked it over to Best Buy and picked up Bioshock The Collection, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and Borderlands The Handsome Collection, plus some jank Blu-ray player for a grand total of $134.02. Then I pummeled over to GameStop, where I absolutely demolished the bank dude. I picked up Gears of War Ultimate Edition slash Rare Replay Combo Pack, Sunset Overdrive, State of Decay, Katamari Forever, and SteamWorld Collection for a price I cannot disclose because that information is tough to come by these days. I like Black Friday, mainly due to the overwhelming sense of holiday spirit and fear in the air. It's always interesting to see what each company will do to prove they're worth each holiday season with different consoles and bundles launching. This year, Microsoft hopes to God that you're interested in an Xbox One X while Sony is still hell-bent on PS4 Pro with neither receiving huge sale prices for the season. I saw a PS4 Pro for $50 off, but that was about it. The PS4 Slim starts at $200 for a 1TB model with PSVR starting at $300 with a Skyrim bundle available for $50 more. Nintendo decided to shoot out a Link model of the 2DS with a copy of Ocarina of Time 3D on it for 80 bucks. I gotta be honest, I'm not a fan of this color scheme. I know it's Link's color scheme, but it just looks like an odd duck of a console to me. Breath of the Wild has a new Explorer's Edition available for the Switch, which is the same price as the base game, but now includes a strategy guide and a map. Yeah, that's cool, I guess, but I think it would have been nicer if they just knocked the price down 10 bucks or so for the holidays. Also, every year Nintendo has put out these brochures around this time. I love picking them up. They just detail a good amount of the games, accessories, and consoles Nintendo's trying to cram down your throat in these brochures' respective years. I mean, this one has a maze for crying out loud. I think Nintendo just sold me on a Wii U. This year, there's not a ton of deals I'm absolutely bloodthirsty for. There's some good stuff here, just... Nothing that really makes me go wow. I'll say I'm definitely interested in Uncharted The Lost Legacy, Everybody's Golf, Near Automata, Resident Evil 7, Doom, Ukulele, and of course Sonic Forces on Switch. Gotta see how this compares to previous years. Here we have GameStop's Black Friday ad from 2016, and hold the phone, a few lucky guests get a rare golden pop vinyl? GameStop definitely knows how to get people in the door. We also have some trendy shirts for only $1.99, and yikes, that's actually quite the price for shirts in general. Half of this page is everything but games. Dragon Quest Heroes, Ratchet and Clank, and The Last of Us Remastered for only $9.99 is a wicked solid deal. Then we flip the page to find a bunch of knickknacks I couldn't care less about, never mind they got Uno. $100 for the new Nintendo 3DS standard size. That was such a solid deal. I love the standard size new 3DS. Its design is just absolutely out of this world. My only problem is I prefer the bigger screens of the 3DS XL models, but man, $100 for that? Get out of here. But hey, who needs an ad from Black Friday 2016 when we can go all the way back to Black Friday 2004? Back when Garfield the movie was only $8.99, such a simpler time. Here at Target, the classic NES series of games on Game Boy Advance were on sale for $13.44 each. Not to overshadow Tales of Symphonia for the GameCube, only $23.44, definitely was in steep competition next to Cabela's Big Game Hunter at the same price. The PS2 and Xbox were only $149.99, with the PS2 giving you Corvette for free. That's definitely a bundle. The Xbox deal gave you three games, Top Spin, NCAA Football 2005, and Crimson Skies for the same price. Now, that's what I call a deal. And the GBA was only 80 bucks with, get this, Spider-Man 2 for free. I can't believe more people haven't reported on this. 2005, man, it's so nostalgic to see portable DVD players to be all the rage. Best Buy has a GameCube Mario Party 7 bundle for a crisp 100 bones, but you could always go with the real deal Mega Pack for only one tenth the cost. GameStop's 2006 ad has Chibi Robo and Fire Emblem Path of Radiance on the GameCube for $15 a pop. That's a fraction of their price nowadays. And that can make it towards a free Razer phone offer if you make it to 50 bucks. Shoot, man, GameStop sold Zunes? Ah, the PS3's launch here. If they didn't have one in stock, you could get a $600 gift card for when they had some. Wind Waker was only 10 bucks, Metro Prime was only four bucks, and finally, an excuse to put my homework down, guys, Perfect Dark Zero is $20. The Wii's launch here made everybody ponder. How do they wrap so much fun in such a little box? I could ask the same thing about the DS because it comes with a free system skin with a purchase. Walmart in 2007, serving hot deals such as an assortment of EA sports titles for only 20 bucks each. The DS had some bundles for the holiday, one with Phantom Hourglass, the other with Dogs. And remember when the Xbox 360 had different SKUs with one named Arcade? I don't know about you, but those SKU names were always a bit confusing. And the year Rock Band hit the scene and eventually tried to come back from the dead just to die even harder in 2015. 
The Door Buster is a deal so hot that it's only available to those who are first to show up. In other words, Game Party is $9.99 at Best Buy, guys. A nice Mario Limited Edition DS and a crazy 4 bundle heavy hitter for the 360. A 360 bundle where you get to decide between Call of Duty 4 or Bakugan. I would really love to see the analytics of what was chosen more. Free Wii music with a purchase of Super Mario Galaxy. Thank you. The PSP Go, also known as Failure, a digital only PSP, not the best thing in 2009. And hey, the PS2 was still pounding thoroughly. Wow, new Super Mario Bros. Wii for $9.99? Oh, after trades, that's one heck of a mislead. 2010, the 25th anniversary of Super Mario Brothers, meaning we got a slick limited edition Nintendo DSi XL, plus some limited DSi colors including Mario Party DS. And Mario vs Donkey Kong Mini Land Mayhem is guaranteed in stock, thank god. Sticking with the Mario anniversary, the sickest version of the Wii out there, the limited red variant, coming with a copy of not only Wii Sports, but new Super Mario Brothers Wii. In Japan, this red console was actually released with a copy of the original Super Mario Brothers pre-installed, with the question blocks added to say 25 on them. Neat shit. Ah, the year PlayStation Move and Kinect came out. For the low, low price of $100 or $150, you too can buy your way into the world of incompetent controls. Also, $130 for a PSP, Little Big Planet, and sit down for this, a UMD copy of the Karate Kid. If you like Donkey Kong Country Returns, surely you'll like Cloudy with a chance of meatballs on Wii. Surely. Nothing is cooler than looking back at some ads from the 90s, an era I wholeheartedly remember. The Toys R Us ad from 1996 shows off the hot new release of the Nintendo 64. Pop a Game Boy Pocket on the side for only 60 bucks, with a wide selection of games included but fundamentally limited to Iron Man, XO, Man of War, and Heavy Metal. Get this, you pick up a Saturn for 200 bucks, play games online, another 200. Most PlayStation games were hovering around the $45 mark, which ain't bad considering this was the era of $70 for NBA hang time on the Super Nintendo. And $7 Game Gear games, you're losing money not acting on that deal. After you pick up your $25 copy of Sonic Forces, spend time with your family and friends, and then go wild and pick up some slick stuff. Hopefully this Black Friday I'll bring in quite the haul. I bought fucking soap!